but God does. He worked it out that way. You may think you worked it out that way or somebody else worked it out that way, but God worked it out that way because that's the God we serve. He moves our ways, our days, our minutes. And as we sang earlier, holy, holy, holy is the Lamb. Let us not forget what a great God we serve. Let us not forget. Forgetting is easy to do, especially for me. I thank God every day that his word is written down. We're going to be in Exodus today, chapter 12. I remember when all of our children were at home and Sunday morning was sometimes a rat race. Be ready. Get ready. Hurry up. There's a lot in the phrase, be ready. Today I hope that we can look at that phrase and I hope you can remember today and the message today about be ready. I'm going to use a simple little word. It's easy as pie. Easy as pie. I don't know anybody that doesn't like pie or some form thereof. I really like lemon ice box pie, if anybody wants to know. <laughs> it's easy as pie to be ready. Doesn't seem like that sometimes, does it? When you've got 10 minutes to do it all in or a short period of time to do it all in. Here's why I'm going to say it's easy as pie. We're going to look at God's preparations. We're going to look at God's instructions. And we're going to look at God's expectations. Pie. And I hope this morning, as God speaks to each one of you in the way that only he can, that it will be as enjoyable as your favorite piece of pie. Or at least move you as much as you would move if you were going to the table for your next piece of your favorite pie. Because God can speak to you in ways that no one else can. Now, I, I'm going to use a couple of illustrations to get started with to help us get our mindset set for what we're going to talk about today. I like to laugh. I hope you like to laugh. This is in no no disrespect for me being in the pulpit, but I've got two illustrations that I want to use to help us get our minds geared towards what we're going to talk about today. The first one is one that Jerry Clower told, and I always like those, but he told a story one time about a little town that had a building downtown, and they'd had a drought for years, and everything was so dry, and this building downtown caught on fire. And all the people in the town were just standing around whining and pining because there was no water to draw up out of the well whereby they could put the fire out. And they were just standing there. And Aunt Pet and Uncle Versi were coming to town that day, and they had all their kids stacked around the back of the pickup truck. There was Raynell and Burnell and Arnell and W.L. and L. and Udell and Oldell and Marcel and Claude and Eugene and Clovis. And they was all stacked around the back of that truck. And there was a hill that come down into town, and so here they come, and everybody heard him coming to town because he had a loose fender on his truck, and it's bloppity, 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 bloppity. And they said, well, here comes Uncle Versi and Aunt Pet. And they rolled down that hill and right into town, and right up in the middle of that building that was on fire, they rolled right up in the middle of that building, and Uncle Versi jumped out, and he took the bibs off his overall, and whop, whop, and he was putting the fire out over here, and all the kids jumped off, and they had the bibs off their coveralls, and it was whop, and whop, and they put the fire clean out. They said, oh, Uncle Versi is our hero. And they took up a collection for him. They gave Uncle Versi $23.14. And one fellow said, uh, Mr. Ledbetter, 
What are you going to do with all that money? How are you going to spend all that money? He said, the first thing I'm going to do is get the brakes on that truck fixed. <laughs> if you don't tend to your situations in life, you can find yourself in precarious situations. We have to tend to business. When I was in high school, the football team went down to Lebanon, Tennessee to work the dog trials. Dogs are pretty smart. And so in this place where they had some of us boys, we had two boys over here, two boys in the middle, and two boys way over here, and there was about 30 yards between us. And they would have way back up on the hill, they would have these guys up there what had these real smart dogs, and they would, they would point their hand like this, and the dog would look in that direction, and one of us would grab the duck that was already dead, grab the duck, and the other fella shot a blank and a shotgun, boom, and the dog thought, got that one. And then they would come to the middle, and then they would come, because we were in the middle, me and Donnie. And I, we could see them. They pointed towards us. And I grabbed that duck and pew, And Donnie, he grabbed the gun and click. And I guess the dog thought the duck just died of a heart attack. I don't know. <laughs> Down he went. Here those guys come. They were mad. I said, Donnie, put a, put a shell in that gun quick. He broke it down, stuck another shell in there, and they got down there, and they said, what in the world's going on down here? Donnie said, it, I don't know, it just didn't go off. The guy grabbed that gun, boom, and everybody jumped real hard. The truth be known, me and Donnie was fooling around down there a little bit more than we should have been, not paying attention. And we found ourselves in a precarious situation, one that we did not want to be in. If we don't tend to the things in our lives, we'll end up in precarious situations. We need to always be ready. I mean, how many of us left the house and said, well, I'm going to leave early today. I'm going to have a flat. I've got to leave time to fix it. No. What you ought to have done is check the spare tire because nine times out of ten, it's not got enough air in it to put on, does it? We just let it go, and we weren't ready. We all do that, don't we? Every one of us has probably got a flat spare tire somewhere at our house. We have to take care of the business at hand. God wants us to be people who prepare. In Exodus chapter 12, I'll read this one verse, and then we're going to go through a plethora of verses. The verse we're going to focus on today is Exodus chapter 12 and verse 11. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 11. It says, And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray today that you will speak to each heart here. You've brought us all together to worship you and to praise you and to hear you speak your word into our hearts. And Lord, I pray that each one here would open their hearts and minds to you and you alone. And these things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God had some preparations for the Israelites. They were trying to get ready to leave Egypt. And a lot of people read these chapters in Exodus and they, th they think, boy, you know, God was really wearing those Egyptians out. But God was doing more than that. God was preparing the hearts and the minds of all the Israelites to be ready to go. To be ready to go. Now, how many times 
have you gathered your children together and you were so excited we're going to go to this place or this place today and come to find out actually maybe you and your wife were the only two excited and you had to drag your kids along or coax them to go or promise them an ice cream or something like that well you know grown ups sometimes are no different are we <laughs> you know Sometimes somebody makes an announcement, we're going to go and we're going to do this. And I'm like, I probably got something to do that day. <laughs> we're all the same, aren't we? Well, God used a lot of plagues to make preparations for them. Chapter 7, verse 19, the first one. In Exodus chapter 7, 19 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying to Aaron, Take thy rod and stretch out thy hand upon the waters of Egypt, upon the streams, upon their rivers, and upon their ponds, and upon all their pools of water, that they may become blood, and that there may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in the vessels of wood and in the vessels of stone. And Moses and Aaron did so as the Lord commanded, and he lifted up the rod and smote the waters that were in the rivers in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, and all the waters that were in the rivers were turned to blood, and the fish that was in the river died, and the river stank, and the Egyptians could not drink of the water of the river, and there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. Now, do you think the Israelites are sitting over here saying, boy, I bet the Egyptians had never seen anything like that before. No, they were sitting there thinking the same thing. Oh, I've never seen anything like this before. God was preparing their hearts as well and their minds for what he had in store. And as you go through these plagues, they're not just something that God said, ooh, that would be good and gross. No. The Egyptians had gods for most of these things that happened. For the river Nile, they had a god who personified Nile. He was called Hopi. Well, their god didn't do so good at that time of day, did he? And then the second one says... And if thou, and, and it's in chapter 8 and verse 2, if thou refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all thy borders with frogs, and the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into thy house and into thy bedchamber, and upon thy bed and into thy house, and thy servants, and upon thy people, and into thine ovens, and into thy kneading troughs, and the frogs shall come up both on thee and upon thy people, and upon all thy servants. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying to Aaron, Stretch forth thy hand with thy rod over the streams, over the rivers, and over the ponds, and cause the frogs to come upon the land of Egypt. And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. Frogs. How many of you ever had frogs in the house? How many of you got kids? I found a frog in our closet one time. It would already expired. For some time. Frogs. Nasty old frogs. Well, they had gods to the frogs, too. He was called H-E-K-T. I don't know how to say that, but that was their frog goddess. Now, that's messed up. But they worshipped it. It wasn't just because frogs were gross. God was saying, I am the Lord God and there is none beside me not even the frog God and then in uh, same chapter verse 16 the third plague and, and the Lord said unto Moses saying to Aaron stretch out thy rod and smite the dust of the land that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt and they did so for Aaron stretched out his hand and with his rod and smote the dust of the earth and it became lice in man and in beast and all the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. Now I can tell you what one head of lice can do to a household. It'll throw you in panic. Imagine a whole land full of it. And then the fourth one. 
Verse 20, And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning, and stand up before Pharaoh. Lo, he cometh forth to the water, and say to him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Else if thou wilt not let my people go, behold, I will send a swarm of flies upon thee, and upon thy people, and into thy houses, and the houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies, and also the ground whereon they are, and I will sever in that day, listen to this, I will sever in that day the land of Goshen in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there. To the end thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth, and I will put a division between my people and thy people, and tomorrow this sign shall be flies everywhere. Have you ever had a mess of flies and you couldn't get rid of them? And you'd think, man, where did all these flies come from? But God's people in the land of Goshen did not have the problem with flies. Now, that's pretty much something, isn't it? We, we spend all day trying to figure out how to keep the flies out of our house, and God kept them out of the whole land of Goshen without nary a screen window. He's preparing for what is to come. He is telling them, be ready. Chapter 9, the, the fifth plague. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto Pharaoh and tell him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. For if thou refuse to let them go and will hold them still, behold, the land of the Lord is upon thy cattle which is in the field, upon the horses, upon the asses, upon the camels, upon the oxen, and upon the sheep. There shall be a very grievous murrain, and the Lord shall sever between the cattle of Israel and the cattle of Egypt and there shall nothing die of all that is in the children of Israel. And then in verse 8, the sixth plague, And the Lord said unto Moses and unto Aaron, Take to you handfuls of ashes, of the furnace, and let Moses sprinkle it toward the heaven in the sight of Pharaoh, and it shall become small dust in all the land of Egypt, and shall be a boil breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beast throughout all of the land. And even the magician said, oh, uh, This is the finger of God. Now, they had a God who was the healer of all diseases, and they call that God Isis. Well, couldn't heal this one. And then the seventh one in verse 13, And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me, for I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart and upon thy servants and upon thy people, that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. And then in verse 18 it says, Behold, tomorrow about this time I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such as hath not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof, even until now. And, and boy, did it hail, and the fire came down and ran across the ground. And they had gods for all these things too. But they found out that there was a God, the God of the Hebrews, that could control these things. And then in chapter 10, in verse 1, the eighth plague. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I might show these signs before him. And verse 4 says, Else if thou refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow will I bring the locusts into thy coast, and they shall cover the face of the earth. That one cannot be able to see the earth, and they shall eat the residue of that which is escaped, which remaineth unto you from the hail, and shall eat every tree which groweth for you out of the field. And they shall fill thy houses, and the houses of all thy servants, and the houses of all the Egyptians, which neither thy fathers nor thy fathers' fathers have seen since the day that were upon the earth, 
unto this day. And he turned himself and went out from Pharaoh. And Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt. And the Lord brought an east wind upon all the land that day and all that night. And it was morning, and the east wind brought the locusts. And they were all over the land of Egypt. Very grievous were they. Before them there were no such locusts as they, neither after shall such be. They covered the face of the whole earth so that the land was darkened. And they did eat every herb of the land and all the fruit trees. And there remained not any green thing in the trees or the herbs of the field throughout all the land. You'd think you'd remember that, wouldn't you? You'd think you'd remember these things. And then the ninth one. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thy hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in the land of Egypt three days. They saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Now go figure that one out. They had gods that they worshipped for the sun and for the moon and the luminaries that God had provided. Yet God himself could cause darkness on the land of all the Egyptians and give light to his people. Does that sound like anything you know of today? where there seems to be such a darkness on all the land, but God's people have the light. We have the light. Who is it? Burger King, where's the beef? Man, they got nothing on us. We got the light. Egypt had all the cattle, and they died. But we got the light. There is no other God beside me. Then, then, Exodus chapter 11, the last plague. And the Lord said unto Moses, Yet will I bring one plague more unto Pharaoh and upon Egypt, and afterwards he will let you go henceforth. When he shall let you go, he shall surely thrust you out hence altogether. And Moses said, Thus saith the Lord about midnight, Will I go out into the midst of Egypt? And all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of the beasts. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall be like it any more. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast that ye know how that the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. Let me tell you something, folks. There ought to be a difference between God's people and the people of the world. There ought to be a difference. People ought to be able to see a difference. They ought to be asking themselves, how do you do it? I don't understand all these problems or all these issues or this situation came up and you handled that like a champ. Let me tell you something. If you're one of God's children, you can handle whatever God puts on you, but only because God allowed it and he's already made a way for it and you give him all the glory because of it. Amen? There ought to be a difference. Well, God made sure there was a difference because he could. God can. God was preparing the Israelites to be obedient when the time came. That's the big question, isn't it? Will I be obedient when the time comes? The time will come. Tests will come. Satan will try to derail you at every turn and every straight stretch that you try to traverse in your life. Satan will try to throw you off the tracks. But let me tell you something. Obedience will keep you where you need to be. Obedience will place you in the right place 
even in the wrong time. Obedience. He was preparing his people to be obedient. I mean, okay, uh, kind of like maybe kind of like this. All right, I've lived where we live now. Me and my wife, we've lived there for a long time. Uh, Victoria was born in '95, and it's a little before that, say '93. Well, I've lived in that house since 1993. I don't want to move. I ain't lived there that long, but I still don't want to move. I'm kind of satisfied where I'm at. Now, God may tell me next week it's time to move. I don't know. I hope not because I don't want to move. And that's just me and Kim. We're talking about 600,000 men age 20 and up, not to count the women, the children, and the neighbors, and the dogs, and the cats, and the cows, and the sheep, and the goats. It wasn't no little feet. These people had to have it in their mind. If God says go, we better go. Now, after all these plagues, you'd think that'd stick like mud on the wall, wouldn't you? So he was preparing them. We miss many of God's blessings that he has for us because we're disobedient at times. God doesn't bless disobedience. God doesn't wink at sin. We can't live a sinful life and just wallow in it and think, well, God's going to bless me. Probably not. Sorry. God blesses obedience. So, seems to me that they were well prepared for what was coming. And then we come to God's instructions in chapter 12. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. This shall be the first month of the year to you. Now, not only is he fixing to take them out of that land, but he changed their calendar. Pretty good sizable bit. <laughs> he said, This is going to be the first month for you. And imagine having to change that kind of track. I'd do good to stay in the right week. And take and and uh, and and it shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take them every man a lamb, <coughs> according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. Remember that the tenth day of the month, they're going to take a lamb. Holy, 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 is the lamb. And if the household be, can get this, if the household be too little for the lamb, you see, we can be too small for God, but God's never too small for us. Amen. If the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of souls. Now, uh, you can read and get different numbers, but they figure about 12 to 15 people was what could partake of a lamb responsibly. So, you know, a lot of times you'd have just you and your wife or maybe you and your wife and some in-laws and maybe two or three houses, households went together with a lamb because God thought of everything. And every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, without blemish, without blemish. Is there anyone here without blemish? Is there anyone in this world without blemish boy we've got a great need don't we for one without a blemish and we know who that is don't we holy 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 is the lamb without blemish a male of the first year you shall take it out from your sheep or from the goats and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month until the 14th day of the same month now which day did we take it on the 10th and which day do we keep it on and we're going to kill it on when? The 14th. And that's how many days? And when did Jesus come into Jerusalem? And how many days later did it get prepared? And he put himself on that cross. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm.
and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the house wherein they shall eat. So they put it on the side post and they put it on the lintel or overhead. And you think they put any down here? No. God's salvation is not to be trodden underfoot. We're covered in the blood. We're going through the blood because of the blood. It's all about the blood. Amen. It's nothing but the blood. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat. Partake. They're going to partake of the lamb. How often do we partake of the lamb? How often do we sink our teeth into God's word? How often do we sink our teeth into things which are godly, into things which are holy? How often do we sink our teeth in the things that God wants to show us that are real because he is God, he, because he can and we can't. He has and we haven't and he will because a lot of times we won't. So partaking of it, they're eating of it. Roast with fire, tried by the fire. Purity comes out of the fire. Sin is thrown in the fire. They're going to roast that lamb. And they're going to have unleavened bread. You see, leavened bread is, <laughs> leavened bread is rotten bread. Why do you think they call it sour mash? It's rotted. I'll throw in a little sidebar here. The devil's drink ain't never been good for nobody. I heard a man say one time, I ain't never seen a home put together by alcohol, but I've seen plenty torn apart because of it. Unleavened bread. Purity. Sinlessness. And with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Anybody ever got a mouthful of lemon juice? You remember that? Hard to forget, isn't it? That's why God's having them eat bitter herbs because of the bitterness of their being a slave, their bondage. He doesn't want them to forget. God doesn't want us to forget. It says, eat not of it raw, which they did a lot of their worshiping gods and the Egyptians, nor sodden at all with water or boiled, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof, the innards, all of it, the whole thing. It's all or nothing. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire, and it shall all be consumed. Okay, right there, right there, right there on those instructions. Don't, don't wait. Don't. Let it go. It's totally, totally consumed. In uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm getting there. I'll talk fast if you will listen fast. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Living in sincerity and truth. Remember when John and Jesus walked by, and what did he say? He said, Behold the Lamb of God. Be ready, consumed completely. It was all gone that night, not the next day. Man, I'm going to tell you something. I like leftovers. Here, I don't know, here a while back, uh, I got hungry, and she got hungry, and we made a mess of potatoes mashed potatoes and cornbread and peas or green beans and corn. I forget what all we had. And we had that for two or three days. 
But when it comes to God and being ready for God, yesterday's gone. Tomorrow, we don't know what tomorrow holds. Today is it. This is it. Today is the day of salvation, God says. Consume it all while you have the chance to consume it. Take it all in. Let God speak to you as much as he wants to when he wants to. Get all you can of God and his goodness. You're here today. God is speaking to you differently than he's speaking to somebody else. But let God speak to you. Let him talk to your heart and your mind. Take all you can in of what God has to say to you today because this is it. Now, I'm supposed to come back tonight to have the service tonight, but between now and then, I may go home to heaven. I don't know. This is all we've got. Today, right now, don't put it off. Don't wait. Be ready. God expects us to be ready. That's where I'm going to go right here in verse 11. Everything else was just to get us ready for verse 11. He says, ye shall eat of it with your loins girded. Now, unless... They, they had big flowing garments then, and they'd have to take a lot of the tail end of it or a piece for a girdle, and they'd have to pull everything up and cinch it up. Now, I've never run in a dress, and I don't aim to try it, but I know you women know what it'd be like to run in a dress, and it probably wouldn't be very easy. You'd have to pull that thing up and cinch it around, and then you'd be ready to go. But the thing is, God says to be ready. Tighten up the, the cinches, batten down the hatches. Take care of the things that need to be taken care of. Be ready. Ready to go at a moment's notice. And then he said, and your shoes on your feet. They didn't normally wear their shoes in their houses. As a matter of fact, a lot of times they might not even have worn shoes. It's a It's a... Customary attitude to think of those in bondage or slavery as those without shoes, barefooted. <laughs> and so they put shoes on their feet in their house because they needed to be ready to go. It was, a, it was kind of a sign of freedom. Freedom is coming. Our release is coming. Our bondage is about over. Be ready to go. Deliverance is coming. Joy is coming in the morning. Boy, oh, happy day they had when God said go, and they were ready to go. Ephesians 6.15 says, be prepared. Have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. Be ready. Take the gospel with you everywhere you go. Psalms 23.4 says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. It says, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Thy rod and thy staff, they come from me. What's the difference between a rod and a staff? Well, the conclusion that I have come to as I thought about this, and studied and prayed, the rod and the staff is a sign of comfort and brotherhood. They all had their staffs ready to walk. They all had their staffs ready to go. And it, uh, also a sign of correction and fellowship. The rod of correction and the staff of fellowship. Be ready. If God wants to walk with you for a while, be ready to go. That would be a walk to have, wouldn't it? Every day, any time you can take a walk with God, his rod of correction would be a rod of comfort. His staff would be a staff of fellowship and brotherhood. Man, they were all in this together. All three and a half million or so of them. Be ready to go. And he says, eat it in haste. Don't put off the things of today. Today is the day. God expects us to be ready. Now, I want you to notice something else after I've closed my Bible. 
I want you to notice one other thing. Exodus chapter 12 and the last part of verse 22 says, And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. God is telling them, you're under the blood, stay under the blood. If, you, if you're not under the blood of Jesus, you're in trouble. You're in a bad way if you're not under the blood of Jesus Christ. If you're not under the blood of Jesus Christ, you cannot stand before God with your sins forgiven because when God looks down at you, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he sees the blood of Jesus that covers your sins and it will make you as white as snow. Your sins will be gone as far as the east is from the west. You know, you can go north or you can go south, and pretty soon you're going north again. Or you can go north, and pretty soon you're going south again. But you can head east, and you will never change directions as long as you walk around the earth. You'll go east forever, and you'll go west forever. And your sins will be forgiven as far as the east is from the west. Let me ask you something. Are you ready to meet God? because you don't know when that time is going to come. He says, gird up your loins. Put your feet, uh, put your shoes on your feet. Put your staff in your hand. I say to you, take hold of Jesus and his redemption for your sins and hold on to it because God says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And today can be the day of salvation for you. Let me ask you, are you under the blood of Jesus this morning. And for those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, let me say this. The eating of the lamb, it was typical of our gospel duty to Christ. We must take Christ and his yoke because being a Christian is godly work. We must take Christ and his cross because being a Christian brings godly burdens. And we must take Christ and his crown because Christ is Lord and we are not. He is Lord. God expects us to be ready. Are you lost? Have you never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? You have a decision to make today. Am I going to be ready? Or am I not? It's a decision that you just have to make. Today is the day. Don't put it off. Consume it all today. Leave nothing behind. Take care of business today. If you're here today and you're struggling with something, you're struggling with something. Man, let me tell you something. If God can protect his people through all of these plagues and bring them out to a land that he had promised them, don't you think God can bring you out of your bondage of sin? Don't you think God can deliver you from where you are in the middle of that desert? Don't you believe that God is who he is? Then you make way today. You gird up your loins and you get that staff in your hand and you come down here and you pray about it to God. Or I'll pray with you or somebody will come pray with you. But today, don't let it pass. Consume it all today. We're going to have a word of prayer. If uh, musicians will come, we're going to sing hymn number, hymn number 405. I'm going to have a word of prayer, and then you simply respond today as God would have you to respond. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you for being Almighty God. And, Lord, thank you for today, right now. And I pray, Lord, that each one of us would respond in a manner that's pleasing unto you. And these things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You've been watching the worship services of Allen's Baptist Church. If the Lord's touched your heart and you'd like to have a personal relationship with Jesus, let me ask you to bow your head right now and pray this simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I understand that I'm a sinner, and as a sinner, I cannot save myself. Right now, by faith, I turn from myself and from my sin, and I turn to you. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to come into my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you prayed that prayer, we'd like to send you some follow-up material. You can call the church office. You can email us. You can write us at our church address. We'd be happy to send you some follow-up material. 
If you'd like to know more about the Islands Baptist Church and our ministries, please contact us. We'd be happy to send you any information that would help you. Thank you, and God bless you.